Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Bible Q&A. Today we're discussing what kind of knowledge do we need for salvation? Well, a good way to answer this question would be to try to answer some of the question words. We'll do who, what, where, when, and how. Once we know the answers to those, by studying the scriptures according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, we'll know enough about salvation to figure out if we're eligible and how we can take advantage of this opportunity. For example, who can be saved? The Jews thought that only the Israelites could be saved, and they happened to be the only ones left. And this belief was so widespread that even Peter didn't want to be seen with non-Jews in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 13, much to Paul's dismay. However, in reality, both Jews and non-Jews can receive the good news. As it was said in Romans, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 The gospel was only sent to the Jews first because they were the chosen people according to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 to 7, and to fulfill God's promise to Abraham that through him all nations would be blessed, according to Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. Also, who's saving us? Normally, it isn't important to learn about the firefighter or lifeguard that rescued you, but we do need to learn more about God to win salvation. For example, he is wise, Psalms chapter 104, verse 24, powerful, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 12, just, Psalms chapter 89, verse 14, and loving, John chapter 3, verse 16. The next question is, what saves us? And the answer to that is the ransom sacrifice. Biblical law says that sins are cleansed through the shedding of blood, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. So in ancient Israel, animals were sacrificed when their owners broke the law. However, Adam and Eve were made perfect, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29, and then lost their perfection in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. So a perfect life needed to be shed to atone for a loss of a perfect life. As it was said in Exodus, Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Exodus chapter 21, verse 24. Jesus would end up being that perfect person, according to 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. So he came down to earth and allowed himself to be executed, even though he said he could have called legions of angels to rescue him in Matthew chapter 26, verse 53. That sacrifice gives us the chance to do good deeds, help others do good deeds, and be evaluated favorably on the day of judgment. Peter said, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that, whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11-12 to 12. Another question is where will we end up? The afterlife is a common feature of many religions, and many Christian denominations teach that good Christians will go to heaven when they die. However, the Bible makes it clear that Christians will be resurrected to live here on earth. As it was said in Psalms, But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Psalms chapter 37 verse 11. It's why we pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, according to Matthew chapter 6 verse 10. The next question is when will we be saved? A lot of pastors say that you are saved as soon as you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but in reality, salvation is a lifelong endeavor. As Jesus said in Revelation, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 as the famous saying goes, actions speak louder than words, and a life of service speaks louder than a verbal confession of faith. The final question to ask is how can we be saved? A jailer asked this question in Acts chapter 16 verse 30, and Paul and Silas responded, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Of course, like I said previously, you have to do this your whole life, so how exactly does this kind of faith work? Well, the simple answer is to just copy biblical role models. Abraham, David, Jesus. 
They obeyed God's commandments, like Abraham's circumcision in Genesis chapter 17. They endured persecution, like Christ with the Pharisees, and overcame temptation, usually. They did all this stuff because of their belief in God. However, there's an example in real life we can use to understand the process of salvation. We have to believe in Jesus the way kids believe in Santa. A lot of Christians don't like God being compared to Santa Claus, but it actually makes perfect sense. There is historical evidence for the existence of Jesus and of St. Nicholas, the person whose Santa Claus is based on. They have both inspired countless Christmas traditions. There are lots of magical stories told about them that those who don't believe think are made up. But most importantly, the belief that kids have in Santa and the faith Christians have in Christ is the same. Kids honestly think that if they behave throughout the year and ask Santa to give them presents, they'll wake up to find presents under the Christmas tree. They believe in him just as much as they believe what teachers tell them in school. That's why Jesus told his followers this, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 18 verse 3 If your faith in Christ isn't as strong as a child's belief in Santa, you won't feel like there's a point in staying on Christ's nice list. The only difference between Jesus and Santa is that we can't go to the North Pole and find proof of Santa's existence, but we can use biblical prophecy to prove that Christ is here right now, trying to save his sheep, according to Matthew chapter 25 verse 32. And that is where I'm going to stop with this Bible Q&A. What kind of knowledge do we need for salvation? We need to know who the rescued and the rescuers are, what will save us, where we will go, when we'll be saved, and how we can be saved in the first place. Thank you for listening! Don't forget to like and subscribe!